good to be with you today and on this Memorial Day weekend and say it's great to be an American, isn't it? We're such blessed people. We sing the song, God shed His grace on thee, and of course we see that in so many ways. We can see it in the bounty that we enjoy. It's an amazing country and uh, all that He has provided and supplied to us, not only to be a bread basket to our nation, but for the world. It's amazing all that God has put at our fingertips here. Of course, we've also been blessed in the fact that the Constitution that we have, it's been a document unlike any other in human history. And uh, we've been so blessed that God put the wisdom in the heart of those founding fathers, the wisdom from His Word, and I believe led of the Holy Spirit to put those things in that document that we have enjoyed and God has blessed for centuries. It's amazing that it's endured as long as it has. But what a blessed people we are because of it. But you know, we're also blessed as we celebrate and remember, really, this weekend because of the people that God has blessed our nation with. And people not only endued with wisdom, but people who have been willing to make the ultimate sacrifice so that we can enjoy the freedoms that we enjoy. And I'm blessed as American. I know that you are too. I think back to those who went through the War for Independence and all that they endured so that we could have these freedoms today. Look back to the Civil War. Boy, the conditions that people suffered through just that we could have the nation that we have today. Go back, and many of us that are here today, many of you endured some of the time, World War II, Vietnam, Korea. Of course, I've endured through times like the Gulf War and the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, and thankful for those who've been willing to lay down their lives. And even those who have come back and yet made such a sacrifice, it's an left an indelible mark upon their heart and on their minds that they will live with the rest of their life. You know what? We're all blessed because of you and because of those who gave those sacrifices. So today I just want to say thanks to the Lord for America and uh, for Americans, uh, the, the brave and the free, which you and I have enjoyed so, uh, so much more, isn't it, than a barbecue weekend. And obviously this year for us, it's not a beach weekend either. <laughs> Uh, and uh, thankful to be with you here today in God's house. Of course, for us as Christians, every day ought to be a memorial day, lived in light of the greatest sacrifice, that which Jesus Christ made, that we might enjoy true freedom, the truth that makes us free, Jesus Christ being the way, the truth, and the life. What a blessed people we are as Americans, but even more as Christians. Uh, God bless His people. We're in Matthew chapter 5 today. You know, I'm amazed at people, <laughs> we're all different, aren't we? Uh, none of us are the same. Our God is a God of creation and creativity. And He didn't make any two people alike. Even with uh, twins and, and identical twins, they can be so different in personality. It's amazing the uh, omniscience and creativity of our God. And yet, while every one of us are different, yet in some ways we're all the same. We all, as parents, have the same desire for our children. We want our children to love us. We want our children to do what's right. We want our children to be happy. In fact, even in our personal lives, every human being on this planet desires to be loved. Every human being on this planet wants to know that their life is important and makes a difference. Every human being on this planet wants to be happy. All of us desire those things. Much of that is the favor of God. In this verse that we read just a moment ago, in Matthew 5, we saw last week that these are verses that have been labeled the Beatitudes. This speaks of supreme blessedness, of the favor of God, of well-being in life. And it tells us in this passage in Matthew chapter 5, as it gives that word, Blessed are, eight, nine times, blessed are these. And it gives a characteristic, it gives a description of those who are blessed. By the way, all those who are blessed are in the kingdom of God. It's talking about God's people. It talks here about our character. and What God desires for our character to be. Certainly to enter into the kingdom, we find a characteristic today that anyone who enters into the kingdom of God must possess at least in small measure, and then God works in our hearts to bring it out in a greater measure. 
We notice in verse number 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What a promise. Not just access to the kingdom, but authority in the kingdom. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. With such a promise, surely we must learn what it means to be poor in spirit. I'd like to speak this morning on that subject. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Let's take just a moment and ask the Lord to help us in these moments to understand these truths and to empower us by His Spirit to live them out. Let's pray. Father, we come to You today and thank You for the moments that we can share in Your presence. And Lord, truly today we want to bow the knee before You. Lord, in our hearts, we pray that You would be high and lifted up. And Lord, as You are high and lifted up and exalted, Lord, we become poor in spirit. We become smaller in our own eyes. To see how great You are, how good You are, and Lord, how desperately we need You. Lord, in the moments that we share together today, we pray they would be shared with You. You at the center of our thoughts, you at the center of this message. Lord, we pray that you'd use all these moments for your glory. In each and every life, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The first thing I have for us to understand today and look at in this phrase, blessed are the poor in spirit, is to really understand and define what it means to be poor in spirit. So that's my first point today. Poor in spirit, defined. To be poor in spirit, first of all, let's understand what it doesn't mean. To be poor in spirit does not mean that you're lacking in personality. That is not being poor in spirit. To be poor in spirit does not mean that you live in a perpetual state of defeatism. That you walk through life saying, nobody likes me, everybody hates me, I guess I'll go eat worms if you're familiar with the song. That's not being poor in spirit. To be poor in spirit does not mean that you view yourself as having no worth. We find that in Christ... We have great worth. He died for me. He lives for me. He's preparing a place for me. He has a plan for me. Great are His thoughts towards me. God gives me great worth. The signs great worth to my life. So it's not poor in spirit to look at myself and to say that I am nothing and nobody could like me and I have no worth at all in my life. Furthermore, to be poor in spirit does not mean that I must go live in a monastery, beat myself three times a day, eating only bread and drinking only water. That's not the way to being poor in spirit. I read about a man who decided that he was going to give up things in his life and, and go learn true poverty of spirit by living in a monastery. And he gave up eating anything pleasant. He gave up sleeping on anything but a hard floor and, and just a, a simple uh, a board that he would sleep on and, and, and uh, wouldn't eat anything nice, wouldn't drink anything but water, and he wouldn't speak except for two words once a year. At the end of the first year, he stood before the master of the monastery and he said these two words, bed hard. Went back and lived a year without saying anything, without eating anything fancy, without ever leaving the monastery. He made a second statement, two words. Food bad. At the end of the third year, he comes and he stands before him and he says, I quit. And he left. And the head monk looked over at another man standing nearby. He said, It's no wonder. All I've ever heard out of his mouth since he came here is complaining. You know, and that's, uh, can I say that's not the way to be poor in spirit? It's not that we have to go through life living in poverty because being poor in spirit does not speak of financial poverty. I had a man who actually came to this church on an occasion. He told me that the way to reach the pinnacle of discipleship in Christ's likeness, that we must give up our homes and be homeless and poor as Christ was. He even walked into this building barefoot because he said that's the best way to becoming poor in spirit. And I say you can be homeless and not be poor in spirit. You can own a home and truly be poor in spirit. It has nothing to do with your financial status. Some think if they put themselves down enough, they'll be poor in spirit. But again, God doesn't want us to think poorly of ourselves. He wants us to think properly of ourselves. The issue, the issue isn't proper loathing of self, but proper leaning on God, as one man put it. 
what it does mean. The word poor, poor in spirit, speaks of absolute poverty, of being destitute and bankrupt. But again, you'll notice poor in spirit, not poor materially. Being poor in spirit means that I, in myself, am bankrupt. I have nothing by which to commend myself to God. Consider a few scripture passages. Jesus said in John 15, Without me, ye can do nothing. We read in Romans 5, When we were yet without strength, Christ died for the ungodly. It meant we were helpless, completely unable, without any strength at all, to change our own circumstances and sin. Christ died for us. Isaiah 64, 6, All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in the eyes of God. So we have nothing in which we can say, Lord, look at me and what I've done, and God be impressed. Paul said this, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. It's a proper understanding of who we are without Christ. It's a proper assessment of myself and of God. And particularly, I want to emphasize this 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 morning, and we've done so in some of the songs that we've sung, but being poor in spirit is an acknowledgement that I am needy. I am needy. The song that we sang just a little bit ago was, I need thee every hour. Those who are poor in spirit understand what that means. Those who are poor in spirit can truly live out the words of that song. I need thee every hour. Lord, I need you. I'm lost without you, hopeless without you, defenseless without you. I'm nothing without you. Being poor in spirit, it speaks of the mind. It speaks of a humility of the mind. Colossians 3, verse number 12. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness. And he goes on giving a list. Romans 12, verse 3. For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that's among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. He says, but to think soberly. Again, think properly of yourself, of who you are without Christ and who you are with Christ. Poverty of spirit is distinct. You'll notice in verse number five, blessed are the meek. Poor in spirit and meekness we often kind of put together because they both kind of center on that humility. But I'd like to make this distinction. The poor in spirit speaks of the mind. The meekness speaks of the will. The poor in spirit says, I will think of myself as I truly am, whereas the meek says, I will submit and yield myself to God because of who He is. The one speaks of the mind, the other speaks of the will. And so what the poor in spirit end up coming to, and this is point number two, and it's just this simple, and that is this. Those who are poor in spirit exercise a divine dependence. Those poor in spirit Exercise a divine dependence. You see, without faith, it's impossible to please God. The reason the poor in spirit are blessed is because they don't depend on themselves. They depend on Jesus Christ. They look to Him to do what they are unable to do. This is where being poor in spirit brings you. It's a realization of our utter poverty spiritually, of our total inability to accomplish anything for God in our own power. So as a result, we look to Jesus. We plead for His mercy. We depend on His grace for His enabling. It's divine dependency. The opposite of self-sufficiency. It's a total christ dependency that we must have, and that is what the poor in spirit experience. Now in Scripture, I want to give you a third D this morning. We have seen poor in spirit defined. We have seen its dependency. Number three, notice a description of the poor in spirit in three places that Jesus gave. Would you first of all turn with me to Luke chapter 18? We're going to see this truth played out in a parable that Jesus Christ taught in Luke chapter 18. I want to take you back to last week's message for just a moment. And one of the key things that Jesus is emphasizing in the Sermon on the Mount and what we saw last week was that Jesus is contrasting what was true religion with what was false. Remember the religion of his day focused on externals. But Jesus Christ said, no, 
It's the internal that's the most significant because when you get the inside right, then the outside's going to be right. It's character before conduct. Conduct is never going to produce right character. Right character produces right conduct. But he also spoke that message to show folks the error of the Pharisee. Pharisees, we remember today, we put them in, in synonymous with, hypocr- with, with hypocrisy. The hypocrites. Well, Jesus told a parable about him In Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse number 9, Jesus said in verse 9, it tells us, He spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee and the other a publican. A publican, a tax collector, a man who worked for the Roman government. A man who, in a sense, sold his soul for money. Here's a Jewish man who's willing to go to work for the enemy to make a buck. And to make it against his own fellow people. So the publicans were despised. They were hated in Jesus' day. It would be like if the Chinese took over the United States of America and they put us to heavy tax. And all of a sudden, I joined forces with the Chinese and came knocking on your door and said, pay up. You'd hate me. You'd despise me. Because not only only were you under slavery, but I had gone to work for the enemy as a traitor. That's the way the publicans were viewed. Jesus said one went to pray as a Pharisee. The other was one of these publicans. The Pharisee stood... And prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Verse 13, the publican standing afar off. The Bible says he would not so much as lift up his eyes toward heaven, but he beat upon his breast. And it says, he said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus said, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Do you see the way these two men saw themselves? The way they viewed themselves in their own eyes? The Pharisee offers a prayer, and get it, he never asked for anything. He had no need. How foolish he was. How blind he was. Meanwhile, the publican, he wasn't even willing to look towards God. Overcome by his sin, He rightly assessed his heart. He rightly assessed his need. And he rightly assessed that God alone could supply it. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I want you to look at another description in Scripture that Jesus Christ gives. Look in Matthew chapter 18 now, if you would. Matthew chapter 18. We're talking about being poor in spirit. And Jesus describes this condition in a number of ways. He does so through the parable of the Pharisee and the publican. We also see in Matthew chapter number 18 how Jesus does so with a little child. In Matthew 18, verse number 1, At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Oh, how often they asked this question. And how foolish was this question. And how it must have broken the heart of the Lord Jesus that they would continue to ask this question. I'm sure as they went, they're thinking to themselves, maybe I'm the greatest. Maybe he'll point at me. And they would think of themselves at such a level. It showed they were lacking this quality of being poor in spirit. So Jesus gives them an illustration. Look at what he does in verse 2. And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them. A little child. You can learn so much about being poor in spirit from children. I love the daily illustrations that I get from my kids. The Bible says, A child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. I'll tell you what, you leave a two-year-old to themselves, it's going to bring the house down. You know what I'm saying? Kids are needy. First of all, kids don't even know what's good for them. They have no idea what's good and what's bad. Some of you saw a picture my wife shared this past week of Noel. She just climbs into the refrigerator, grabs something, opens it up, and starts eating it. You know, it doesn't matter what it is. She doesn't look to see if it's moldy or anything like that. One of my kids, when they were younger, was convinced 
that they would love to drink vinegar just straight out of the bottle. They asked for it over and over and over again. They didn't even know what was good for them. Finally, they tried it. <laughs> oh, man. You see, as a kid, they don't even know what's good for them. But the reality is this. That's what we're like. We often don't know what's good for us. Do you know the Romans tells us that there are times we don't even know how to pray as we should? Do you realize that? There are times where we pray and we speak to God and the Bible says we don't even know what we should ask for. That's the way that a kid is. They don't know what to ask for. We have to humble ourselves. Sometimes we struggle. Say, boy, I've been asking for this for years and God must not be good because He won't give it to me. Well, God sees the big picture. and God knows perfectly what is best. We have to acknowledge I'm just a child in the eyes of God. Hey, you know what? Children don't know what's good for them. Children also, a child left alone will not make wise decisions. <laughs> Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He'll direct thy paths. A child alone makes a mess of things. A child left alone hurts not only themselves, but oftentimes others. And children are needy. When we fill out our tax forms, what do we call them? Dependent. And that's what Jesus is pointing out. The greatest in the kingdom of heaven are those who truly are dependent. Dependent upon the Lord. The reality is we're all dependents, but sometimes in our own minds we get filled with pride and we cease to see just how needy we truly are. I think I can take care of this. I've got the money in the bank. I've got good health. I've got everything in order. I've got great plans. But you know, when we think like that, Jesus gave a parable to the rich fool. He said, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. We trust ourselves. We're foolish indeed. Children aren't afraid. The thing about children is children aren't afraid to be beggars, are they? <laughs> They're not afraid to just come right up and ask for it. I'll get a coffee from Dunkin' Donuts, an iced coffee, you know, and a little bit of cream and sugar in it. My wife gets a lot of cream and sugar, and immediately... The kids start begging. Can I have it if I don't drink it all? Can I have it if I don't drink it all? Can I have that if you don't drink it all? Give it to me. I mean, they just beg and beg and beg. They find one of you has a pocket full of lollipops. You know where they're going to be? Right at your side. Give me, give me, you know? Hey, my little one. Daddy, I'm hungry. Daddy, I'm thirsty. They just come and they see me as the only way to fill their needs. You know, we can learn something from them in that, can't we? So we go to the Lord. Lord, I need you. Every hour I need you. Lord, I need your direction. And you know, when God gives direction, then we act on it. God gives common sense, and I'm thankful for that. But we must never act in life as though we are not needy people. It's never that we grow to say, I can care for myself. Those who think they've come to that place are foolish indeed. Can I give one more illustration that Jesus gives of those who are poor in spirit? Turn to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. I quoted a verse earlier that Jesus Christ shared here. But it's a picture that Jesus uses of a vine, a grapevine, and its branches. And he says in verse number 1 of John 15, he says, I'm the true man, true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing." So he gives an analogy here demonstrating just how dependent on him we are. Something my kids will do from time to time is they'll take a, a tree branch and plant it. In fact, if you go to my yard this morning, there's a tree branch that's fallen over, just got planted the other day, didn't stand up in the storm. But I think in their mind, they're going to take this branch, they put it in the ground, and a tree's going to grow, right? That's the way it works, huh? If I take a, a branch off an orange tree, stick it in the ground, it's going to produce fruit. No. We realize a branch is entirely useless except it abides 
in the vine, except it remains on the tree. Separated, it can't do anything. It's not good for anything. But connected, it produces much fruit. You see, that's the picture that Jesus gives of us. We want to abide in Him. We want to remain with Him. We want to walk with Him and be close to Him because as we are close to Him, the Lord makes us fruitful. It's the life He gives to us. Look, a branch doesn't have life in and of itself. It's the branch that takes life from the tree that the tree supplies. All the nutrition, everything that branch needs to bring forth fruit. By ourselves... We're worthless when it comes to true fruitfulness. But in Christ, we have great value and will be productive. So we see in Scripture being poor in spirit defined. And we can see in Scripture that it's a divine dependency. We can see in Scripture several descriptions. But I want to also see in Scripture that it is demanded that we be poor in spirit. Back in Matthew chapter 5, notice, because this is important. I believe this is of utmost importance, in fact. And that is the order. When Jesus Christ gives the Beatitudes, this list of qualities and characteristics of, of, of supreme blessedness, he starts with being poor in spirit. It comes first. I do not believe that is a coincidence. I don't believe that it's simply that one of these had to be first. I believe that without being poor in spirit, none of the rest of these characteristics is even possible. This is the starting place where our transformation to be like Christ begins. We have to get to the place where we stop looking to ourselves and depending on our own strength, we have to get to the place where we need Christ desperately and where we're looking nowhere else. Charles Spurgeon once said, those who are of no account in their own eyes are of the blood royal of the universe. These alone have the principles and the qualifications for a heavenly kingdom. The Beatitudes, supreme blessedness, begins with the poor in spirit, those who humbly depend on the Lord. Now understand today, being poor in spirit is demanded for salvation. It's not until an individual comes to see themselves as entirely helpless at saving themselves that they will cry out to Jesus to be saved. It's not until an individual sees themselves as truly needy that they will ever experience faith in Jesus Christ. It's interesting, in fact, the word repent, which Jesus said that if, if you would be saved, he said, repent and believe the gospel. Repentance means to have a change of mind. We've got to see ourselves as we truly are. I am so needy. I'm a sinner in the sight of a holy God. And I can't do anything in and of myself to change that fact. You know what, when we see ourselves in need, what we often do is we run around to different sections trying to raise the funds, right? Hey, I've got a need. Let me go over here and I'll check in this bank account. Let me go over here and, and I'll exhaust this, this friendship. Or over here and, and I'll go and I'll max out this credit card. We run around looking to find some way to pay off the debt. You know what being poor in spirit is? It's coming to Jesus and saying, I have no way to pay this off. Except what Jesus Christ did for me. That's it. And the poor in spirit depend on Jesus reaching out and saying, Lord, I need you. Grant me that eternal life. Save my soul. And the Bible says that such faith is saving faith because God gives grace to the humble. We must come today to see my baptism cannot move the needle one minutia. My communion cannot move the needle, if you want to call it mass, it cannot get you any closer to God. My righteous acts, my home, my church, my society, none of these things can move the needle. My desires, my ambitions, the fact I'm a nice guy, have good looks, have great family relations, none of things, these things move the needle even a hair's breadth. In fact, the Apostle Paul says, count it all just dung. It's trash, it's garbage. Come and just claim hold of Jesus alone. He said, that's the way. That's the path. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Praise the Lord. God gives grace to the humble. Being poor in spirit, we divinely depend upon Jesus Christ. And as the Bible says, by grace are ye saved through faith. 
You know, our struggle is we fail to see ourselves as needy, don't we? I heard of a fellow who was having his portrait painted. And after the artist was finished, the man looked at the painting and he said, that painting doesn't do me justice. The artist looked at him and said, what you need is mercy, not justice. Do you know what? That's the way we have to see ourselves all the time. I need mercy. If God gave me justice, I'd be in the pit of hell. It's mercy that I need. In salvation, before you can ever taste of eternal life, you must see yourself as you truly are. A sinner in the sight of a holy God, completely needy, and only Jesus can save. You put your faith and trust in Him, and praise God you are saved. But you know being poor in spirit is demanded beyond just salvation. It's demanded in Christian living as well. If you go to the book of Revelation and you find a series of churches... And you find out five out of those seven churches are reprimanded. The last one, the seventh church, is the Laodicean church. You know what the Laodicean church thought? (laughs) In fact, you hear their thinking that the Bible records it. They said, I am rich and increased with goods, and hear it, and have need of nothing. That's how they assess themselves. I'm completely without need. You know what Jesus said about that church? He said, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. We have to see ourselves as needy. In fact, Jesus said you should see yourself that you in reality are poor and miserable and wretched and blind and naked. He said you're in great need. How can we ever get to to the place where we say, I don't need anything? We must always be at a place where we say, I need the Lord. Because do you know what? Without being poor in spirit, prayer doesn't even make sense. Why pray unless you have a need? What are you going to ask God for except you have a need? You know, in our lives, you want to know just how poor in spirit you truly are and how far you have grown in this measure. We can look at this simply. What's your prayer life like? Do you depend on God daily? Do you go to God daily? Isn't it interesting when Jesus Christ taught us how to pray? You remember what he said? What was it he even taught us to ask for? He said, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Did you see what Jesus just taught us? It's that same principle. I even need him to supply my daily bread. The most basic the most basic necessities of life. I need Jesus for that. I need the Lord for that. Oh, you want to assess yourself today at where you stand as far as this characteristic? Just look at your prayer life. What are you asking God for? What are you thanking God for? What are you expressing to God? Do you ask God for the filling of the Holy Spirit? Amen, today, you say, Lord, I need you that I might be the right husband and father. Or you say, hey, I got this. I say you're going to ruin your family if you do. Maybe wives today, it's the same thing. Lord, I need you. That I might be the right wife and mother to my children. The right grandmother. As a witness, do we ask for God's filling? Lord, I need you today. You see, prayer... Is going, to be, is going to reflect just how poor in spirit we really are. I want us to consider today, finally, how we develop. How do we develop this character of being poor in spirit? Well, we've seen today how it is defined. We've, we've considered today what it is. It's divinely depending upon the Lord. We've seen it described, and we see that it's demanded. Well, how do I become more poor in spirit? How do I get to the place where I see myself as needy, what can be done? First of all, you must be born again. That's the first thing. Unless you have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, unless there's been that time where by faith you reached out and received His gift of eternal life, and the Holy Spirit moved into your life, then you'll never understand or be able to live this out. Trying to become poor in spirit is just going to lead to complete frustration. And by the way, when you finally think you've arrived, it's just going to be pride. 
Hey, I'm finally humble. I got this. <laughs> it's amazing how it, we're so deceived in and of ourselves. You must be born again. The well, second thing today is you need the Word of God. It comes by the Word. Knowing that being poor in spirit is thinking right, thinking truth about myself and thinking truth about the Lord. Well, where do I find the truth that I should be thinking? It's the Word of God. The Word of God is the truth. The Word of God is what purifies our thoughts and purifies our lives. Psalm 51, verse number 6, David said, Behold, Lord, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. So if we would have truth in the inward parts, then we must think the truth. As the Bible says, speak the truth in your heart. This is called meditating on Scripture. It's bringing the truth back to mind over and over and over again. Think truth. It's also in the Word that we study the life of Christ. I'm trying to remind you that every one of these Beatitudes are characteristics of Jesus Christ. Being poor in spirit, Jesus said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. Jesus, the Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, Let this mind have this way of thinking. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. He thought of himself as a servant. For you and I, if we would have the mind of Christ, we must be in the Word of God, studying the life of Christ. Can I also say this? We heard it sung in the song, Bow the Knee Today. That if we're, to be poor, if we're to be poor in spirit, then we must really see God for who He is. You know the reason that we're not poor in spirit? The reason that we don't have that humility of mind and, and we think that we're able and, and we, we assess ourselves as greater than what we really are is because we don't see God as He truly is. The greater God grows in our concept of who He is and the more clearly that we see Him, the smaller we become in our own eyes. The converse is also true. The lower the view we have of God, the greater view we have of self. That's what atheism is. They have no view of God. So they think themselves to be the top. And so they're going to solve all the world's problems. We're going to stop global warming. We're going to save the planet. They can't do anything. Without Christ, you and I can do nothing. If you want to grow to be truly poor in spirit, then you need to see God for who He is. The Bible tells us Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 6, leading up to that point, he was serving God. He was a prophet of God. Certainly, if we would look at his life, we'd say, here's a man of God. And yet in Isaiah 6, he says, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And he heard those angels, holy, holy, holy. And Isaiah's response Woe is me, I'm undone, for I'm a man of unclean lips. When he truly saw God for who he was, he himself was brought to this character of poor in spirit. And by the way, then he was ready to truly serve God. Because that's when he said, in response to the Lord's cry, who will go for me, he said, here am I, send me. You see, it was seeing God for who He was. Can I give you an avenue that sometimes God uses to help us to see how needy we are and how much we need God? And that's trials. You know what God brings us into trials so that we'll depend on Him more? The Bible tells us in the book of Job that Job again was a man early in that book, in Job 1, the Bible says that he was a perfect man. He was mature. He was blameless in character. He feared the Lord. He hated evil. The Lord brought a trial to his life. You know what you find in Job 42? Here's what Job says. He says, I'd heard of thee with the hearing of mine ear. But now my eye seeth thee. Wherefore? 
I abhor myself and repent in sackcloth and ashes. You see that that poverty of spirit came to Job. That he himself became yet more humble in the eyes and the sight of God. You know, the biggest thing that stands in our way of being poor in spirit today is self. We must die to self. There's a statement I heard from the time I was a kid. <laughs> Somebody would offer me something and, and uh, I'd say, well, I don't want that one. And somebody would look at me and I'd say, Jared, beggars can't be choosers. You heard that before? Beggars can't be choosers. You know, oftentimes in life, we fail to see ourselves as we truly are. And we pick and choose what part of God's Word we're going to obey. Beggars can't be choosers. Those who are truly poor in spirit, it's what the Lord says. We say, yes, Lord. We follow His leading. We do as He says. Beggars can't be choosers. We must die to self. The story is told of a young American student. He visited Beethoven Museum in Bonn, Germany. The student became fascinated by Beethoven's piano that was on display there. It was a thrill to think that Beethoven had composed some of his greatest works on that very piano. The student asked the museum guard, can I play a few notes on it? To help persuade the guard, the student even slipped the guard a lavish tip. The guard agreed, and so the student went to the piano and Play the opening of the Moonlight Sonata. And after the student had finished, he said to the guard, I suppose all the great pianists that come here want to play that piano as well. And the guard shook his head and said, No. Paderewski, the famous Polish pianist, was here a few days ago, and he said he wasn't worthy to touch it. Hmm. And I put the student where they belong. You know, if we would assess ourselves right, we hear the promise of God. It says, humble yourselves therefore into the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. When we exalt ourselves, such sorrow is going to come to our lives. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Do you have a divine dependency on the Lord? Do you assess yourself as needy? Are you here today? unsaved? If I asked you this morning, what do you think God requires to get into heaven? If you stood at the gates of heaven and you were asked, why should I let you in? What would be your response? Would you say, well, I've been a pretty good guy. <laughs> I've given X amount of money to the church. I was baptized. I attended this. I'm better than the next guy. You'll never get in. You must come to the place where you say, I have nothing but Jesus Christ. The old hymn goes, Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. That's it. It's all I got is Jesus. Praise God, it's all I need. If you're here today and you don't know that you're saved, you've never assessed yourself that's completely unable to get yourself to heaven. I pray that today the Lord will show you there's one way through Jesus. And except you become poor in spirit and own that you're a sinner in the sight of a holy God, then you'll never depend on Jesus Christ to save your soul. You know, you may say today, oh, I know I've been born again. Are you truly dependent upon Him? How is your prayer life? What are you asking God for? In your daily life, you say, I got this. Are we looking to God for wisdom, for strength, for power? Beggars can't be choosers. Are you truly humble? Say, Lord, whatever you would have me to do. This morning, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray. Father, we come to you today thankful for the opportunity to open your word. Lord, we are very needy. We need you every hour. Without you, we could do nothing. Lord, these aren't 
my declarations. These are your declarations. Lord, it rubs against our pride. It's hard for us to admit that we're totally needy. But Lord, I pray that today you'd give us the grace to rightly assess ourselves. That we need you. Father, I don't know who in our midst today is unsaved. You do. And Lord, maybe it's this matter where they've seen themselves as righteous by what they've done, by who they are. Oh Lord, today I pray you bring them to that place of spiritual poverty that they would trust Jesus Christ alone to save them. And Lord, for your people that are here today, Lord, it's so easy to govern our lives our own strength, our own power. Go without praying. Lord, today convict us of that. Bring us to a right assessment. Bring us to that right place, Lord, where we see ourselves as we truly are, that we would depend upon you to do what we know we can't do. Father, today I pray you'd be exalted and lifted up that we might truly see ourselves and see you in truth. Bless this invitation. Use it for your glory, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You just stand with me today with your head.